So what do you see when you look up at the night sky? One can uh, think but fathom about the wonders of the heavens. And civilizations for a very long time across the globe have tried to understand the mysteries of the heavens, starting from ancient Babylonians, Egyptians, Indians, Arabs, Persians, who had limited data technology, in fact, no technology, who had limited data research and instrumentation, to modern day scientists with so much uh, software, advanced technology, including so much, uh, including a lot of uh, data points. The humanity has always wondered about the universe and also our tiny, perhaps special place in it. Astronomy is one of the oldest known sciences to humanity and I'm pretty sure all of us have at least once in our lifetime asked ourselves this question, what lies beyond? And I am one such curious fellow who pretty much asks this question every single day. My name is Seja Bagari, and I'm an amateur astronomer and a researcher in the field. My research focuses on understanding eclipsing binaries, pulsars, and the cosmic web. Now, I won't get into great detail about these topics, although I will give you uh, kind of just through my talk. But what I really want to do is share my story, uh, my short story about how I pursued astronomy. And I really hope it's the beginning of a greater one. My story starts very uh, early, as early as when I was in grade three. When I was eight years old, we had a beautiful illustration of the solar system in my science textbook. And I asked my science teacher, I could recognize Earth, but I quite wasn't sure what Earth was. So I asked my science teacher, what are these things beside Earth that uh, look like Earth, but in different sizes and colors? She told me that these are called planets. That probably was the first time I heard the word planets, or at least paid attention to. That was around the same time my father introduced my sister and me to the, uh, to the web browser. I very vividly remember on a very fine Sunday, he took me and my sister to the rooftop, and the very first thing he showed us was the Wikipedia article of uh, Dr. Bhimrao Ramji Ambedkar, a very well-known Indian social reformer and a humanist whom my father admired. I asked him if he could show us about those planets my teacher was talking about, and he said, yes, you can literally search about anything. And he showed me the Wikipedia article of uh, the solar system, and he wanted me to read it. And I did read it. I barely could understand anything. But that was it for me. It was partly because I didn't understand what was going on. I was very curious to know more. And when I was about 10 years old, my mom bought me an encyclopedia. And like any other encyclopedia, this one had beautiful illustrations, diagrams, pictures, and maps. The first chapter was called Space. And uh, uh, just like other chapters, this one too had beautiful illustrations of the Big Bang, life cycle of a star, rockets, and many more. In fact, some of these planets were cut off to show us the insides, and my interest definitely deepened then. And that was the very first time my interaction with this field happened. And as time went on, COVID hit the world, and it changed lives, and for me it could not have been more true. Lockdown was announced, and everyone was home. I said, I told myself, I'm really interested in these stars, so why not do something and try to learn more about these stars? And my father, being the most supportive man ever, bought me a lot of books, and I took part in many quiz competitions. And after about an year, I wrote my very first international exam, which was the International Astronomy and Astrophysics Competition, in which I secured the silver honor. And uh, after that, I... See, I loved doing what I was doing, just learning and reading from books, but that was not enough for me. I wanted to do more. I started working on what we call citizen science. Citizen science are projects where non-professionals can contribute to science, or any field for that matter, and especially in science and astronomy, it just means a greater deal. And I worked on citizen science, which included searching for asteroids, looking for supernovae, classifying galaxies, and many others as such. And I wanted to join the American Association of Variable Star Observers, which is a 111-year-old organization coordinating, analyzing, and publishing variable star observations, which are largely made by amateur astronomers. And as the name suggests, variable stars are stars that change the magnitude over a period of time. As you can see in this picture, you can see in the first slide that it is a lot more brighter, and the second one, it's fainter. So these are what variable stars are. And uh, it was absolutely amazing, and I wanted to join the ABSO, and I sent out an application form uh, with all the documents 
to join the ABSO and I was rejected because I was not 18 or older. The ABSO had their policies that only members, uh, only people with 18 or older of age could join the organization and I was rejected. And I got connected to Dr. Stella Kafka who was the then ABSO director and I told her that I'm really passionate about this and I want to be a part of the ABSO. And she told me, after all, astronomy is not just for now, is it? And she told me that after you're 18, we would welcome you. Dr. Kafka and I stayed in touch ever since, thanks to social media. And uh, after about three months of that incident happening, AVS was celebrating its 110th anniversary, 110 years of variable star observations. And I congratulated Dr. Kafka, and she invited me to be a speaker at the 110th annual conference of the ABSO, which was held in Boston, Massachusetts. I couldn't go there, so I gave my talk uh, online. And I spoke about how I pursued astronomy, and Dr. Kafka told me that it is solely because how curious and passionate you are, I think you would be a perfect ambassador for the ABSO. And although I was not 18 or older, I joined the ABSO. And as an ABSO ambassador, I gave multiple talks, presented webinars, and what I really was keen on was popularizing real science. And especially in a, in a country like India, where pseudoscientific beliefs exist, I thought one of the best ways to debunk them was to popularize real science. And uh, I gave talks at international conferences like the 25th Annual Conference of the Global Hanson Universe at the 111th Annual Conference of the ABSO. And while I was giving uh, my talk at the 111th conference of the ABSO, I was asked to write what we call a proceedings paper. A proceedings paper is basically uh, a paper in which you have the summary of your talk, which kind of looks like a research paper, but it's not quite one. And it felt very interesting to see my proceedings paper being published in the JABSO. So the JABSO is a journal of the ABSO, and it's a research journal. So I asked some seniors at the ABSO if there, was if there was a possibility for me to conduct real research and publish those results in the, uh, in the JABSO. I was asked to look at variable stars and calculate their magnitude and send those reports to the ABSO, which is basically what ABSO observers around the world do. You see, I would have loved to do that, but because of the city light pollution, I barely could see any stars, let alone variable stars. I reached out to Professor Thomas J. Macron, who is the President's Excellence in Research Professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Texas Tech University. And I told him that I'm really passionate about conducting research. I love stars, I love the universe, uh, I really want to conduct research in astronomy. Dr. Macron is known for his scholarship in X-ray astrophysics. And he fortunately accepted me to be his research assistant, and we started working on what we call AMCVN systems. So as you can see in this illustration by the NASA, NASA's Chandra X-ray Telescope, AMCVN, which stands for AM Canum Venaticorum, are systems where the denser star is quite literally sucking in material from the other star. And our research involved looking at the extreme luminosity plotting against the orbital period of AMCVN systems and comparing this result to already existing theoretical model prediction. After working with Dr. Macron for about seven months, I published my very first research paper at the age of 17 in the Journal of the American Association of Variable Star Observers, which was then told by the referees, according to the referees, was the largest study conducted on these systems at the time of publication. And I fell in love with research. It was amazing. Although it was very hard, it was amazing. And I loved to, I, I said, uh, I told myself that I wanted to work on many other research projects as such and explore astronomy, other domains of astronomy, because astronomy is a very broad field. And I sent out about 28 emails to 28 different professors. And guess how many got back to me? Just one, who happens to be my other research supervisor, Dr. Ada Kirichenko, who is an observational astronomer, which means we look at visible light and conduct our research based off of that. I was sent data from some really huge telescope from Mexico and Spain, uh, and our research project was about black widow and redback systems. Now, black widow systems are systems where, which are binary systems, where one star is a pulsar and the other is, uh, is its companion star. And pulsars are stars that eject uh, magnetic jets from their poles. And as this jet hit the other star, it quite literally makes it lose its matter. So these are what uh, 
red bag systems are, uh, or spider uh, widow uh, systems are. And the reason they're called uh, spider, black, uh, spider black systems is because just like black widow spiders kill their partner after mating, in a way, the star is killing its partner. And that is the reason why these are called uh, spider black uh, pulsars. And uh, we are currently in the writing uh, stage of the research paper, and hopefully the results will be published next year, and I'm really looking forward for that happening. And my current research involves an understanding the cosmic web, which helps us understand the larger scale structure of the universe and eclipsing binaries, which are stars that orbit each other, and when one star goes around the other, you can see the dip in the light curve because of uh, uh, the lessening of the magnitude over a period of time. So my research journey has been going so great so far, but the thing is research isn't very easy. It's super complicated because it's real science. You publish results out there which will be used by other scientists, and you have to be as precise as possible. And especially for me as a high school student, it was very hard because as, whenever I was hit with a problem, I couldn't figure out the solution in a day or two. Sometimes it took weeks to get to a solution. But about everything, it's always about the curiosity. When I got to know about these resource projects with, uh, with my supervisors, uh, I was always very curious, not only that I would get to work on these projects, but also because I would get to understand what was happening with these systems in a way quite literally uh, exploring the mysteries of the cosmos. And I've published in international journals and magazines, uh, in the global Sky Sub Astronomy magazine, I've published in China twice, and in Serbia once about uh, my research and my research projects. And <laughs> what I really want to do is uh, inspire people, and not necessarily to uh, get into astronomy, but to let them know that the universe is filled with infinite possibilities and that the sky is not the limit. My, uh, th my passion is to answer some of the biggest questions to which I'm not sure if you would get concrete answers in my lifetime, but, I want to, but what I want to do is contribute to getting to these answers. And what I want to tell you people is that, as I said before, the universe is literally filled with infinite possibilities and you never know what's gonna happen and always believe in yourself Keep looking up, the sky is not the limit. Thank you. <laughs>